Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. Hey everyone, if you're watching this podcast, then it's probably safe to say that you're like me and you love hunting, shooting sports, and of course, you support conservation of wildlife and wild places. I really believe in the power of free market principles. So I wanna ask you today to join me in making an impact and consider supporting companies like Ruger, Onyx Hunt, and Dead Downwind that are not only supporting this podcast, but they are also supporting the values and traditions that we live out day to day. Thank you all for watching. Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Wild Nine Cut Podcast. We are coming at you from Kansas. It's like 27th of the month, right? I don't know, but it's 90 degrees. It's 90 degrees. <laughs> I'm here with my good friend, David Westmoreland, and uh, Prairie Land Outfitters, also Whitetail Properties. And um, David and I, poor David, <laughs> poor David. I'm glad you acknowledged that. <laughs> Just David's been suckered into hunting with me. <laughs> like, putting up with me is really what I should say as an outfitter for... You're so kind. Five years or something like that? It's been yeah, a while. Five, tw- no, six, this is our sixth year. Hmm. I'm pretty sure. Time flies, I guess, when you're having fun. Or miserable. <laughs> no, we've had fun, believe it or not. Well, I have, but sorry, I'm eating the rest of my lifesaver. <laughs> A little crunchy, crunchy there. Mm-hmm. I'm addicted to those things, you know. Lifesavers? Oh my gosh, it's the window. Those green. things will kill you. I something's got to. If you eat enough of them, they say it will. I don't know. But my grandma used to eat them too, but I can't help. Sorry, I'm done. I won't eat anymore. (laughs) I'm done after that. Now we, so six years, I think my first year hunting Kansas was 20, I know it was 2018. It was your second year. Hunting with you. Yeah. 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 So you've. I guess it was. We did Missouri first. Yeah. Or did we? We did. Missouri was first, 2017. What happened was I had a a friend, um, Rick Lawyer. Oh, I used to work with a She Outdoor Apparel. You're not your friend anymore? Well, no, I am. Yes, still a friend. <laughs> but Rick, I called him, or I ran into him at Shot, I can't remember, and I said, look, I, I really need to find somebody to go whitetail hunting with. <clears throat> I don't have a clue about whitetail hunting. I don't know where to go. You didn't have. Now you're an expert. No, I've gotten better, though. You and have unfortunately, <laughs> the only thing I know is what you've taught me, so mm-hmm. good, bad, or... Come here, you got one of those black things on your face. Good, bad, or, or indifferent, I, I mean, anything I know to a fault is from you, so I'll directly blame you uh, for that. But yeah, well, you're a good learner anyway, listener. Well, it's just doing what I'm told, David. Uh, <laughs> wait, what's your motto? It's your hunch. You can screw it up however you want. That's one of them. That's one of them. That's the <laughs> G-rated version. <laughs> yeah. He's like, look, Christy, it's your hunt. You can it up however you want. And I do. Most hunters do. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, 2017, I came to Missouri and we had, remember, Nick and I had underneath our stand this monster, non-typical, I never got a shot oh, at it. Remember? Was that the first year? That was the first year. And that thing was just a dragon. And we <laughs> were going to move our stand um, because he was crossing at like 80 yards along that fence. And he was just an uh, it's still the biggest deer I've ever seen here. That was a big deer. And never got him killed. And then I ended up killing a really nice old deer, a big nine. Uh, and he was. Oh, a, that was at the, the Pilot the, Grove. Yeah, yeah. That was the place you used to have. That yeah. was the first deer I killed yeah. with you. Yeah. I was sitting there trying to think of where it was, but I remember yeah. now. Yeah, it was a long time ago. <clears throat> you made a good shot on that one and everything. Yeah, it was a good, good, a good hunt. Mm-hmm. That was a great deer. Probably still my oldest deer. That was probably the toughest hunt, too. It was like eight degrees for 
the whole time you were there just about. Yeah, it was, it was, it was cold. cold. But the coldest one I had was that one a few years ago where the daytime high was six. And that sucked. And you still sit all day. Yeah. <laughs> it was miserable. That yeah. was horrible cold. It was so cold. You just didn't want it. Yeah. it was it, On a day that cold, you probably shouldn't even hunt. But you always have the chance of a big one coming through. Well, when you're limited to five or six days or whatever, you got to hunt every day. Well, that's I the mean, thing. So people, I mean, I don't want to be like one of these people. I have a show. And, you know, David, your trophy room is unbelievable you've harvested some of the most incredible deer i've ever seen in my life um you know, with with a bow and you've hunted exclusively with a bow pretty much a little few rifle hunts but pretty much exclusively with a bow but you know like someone like me comes out you have five days to capitalize you on the other hand to kill some of these big deer the people that are doing it in five days are lucky or they have an outfitter that's really got a good pattern on something. Lucky. Lucky. <laughs> yeah, lucky. But you, I mean, you just, you'll spend three months and you'll hunt one deer. Mm-hmm. Like you won't even, well, you know. Well, it wasn't always that way though. I mean, like back in the early 90s and stuff, you know, it was about how many good deer you could kill. And yeah. So it was different <clears throat> then. But now I, I'm tickled to death if I just kill one deer. Yeah. You know, as long as it's a good one. Yeah. When you'll focus, you know, you'll scout and, you know, you're, you really have this full, you know, year round deal. And I love it. I get tickled when you send me pictures. Um, look at this one. Like the one <laughs> idea you sent me in Missouri this year. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that thing is in trouble if it's still around and I'm there. Well, I'm, you knew you had a 50 50 sh- chance because he's only got one eye. That's right. <laughs> I need every advantage I could get. No wonder you was happy. <laughs> 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 I'll take the one-eyed ones, whatever, it doesn't matter. But I think I think a lot of it, you know, with when people are looking at coming out, you know, to the Midwest, or I say coming out to the Midwest because to me it's coming out here, but I guess when you're hunting in the Midwest in general, you know, when you book a hunt with an outfitter and you've got five days. It's, it's a lot of pressure. Not only that, but there's so many little things that can go wrong. Like right now we're in Kansas. You have a deer that's been on camera for a week and a half solid. He disappeared yesterday morning, of course, the day I got here. We're going to hunt him tonight. It's the first night we've had wind for him. But we're driving in, and you look at me, and you're like, the neighbor cut his corn. <laughs> it's always something. That's why I told you the other day. There's, uh, any little change changes everything. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't take noth- nothing. A windstorm, you know, it, it you know blows the acorns out of the tree. And instantly, the deer go to those. Yeah. And, changes their food source and then you're back to square one you start all over again so it makes it really tough and it's frustrating as an outfitter because you can be like i've got this yeah and then the client shows up and there's nothing and they think it's you yeah but you can't fight mother nature i mean it like i said any little change and you're screwed well last year we were here in november and it was cool in the morning you know you'd bundle up in the morning and then it'd be 80 degrees 85 degrees during the day how Killed us. oh my gosh it was awful oh, yeah. i mean the deer just weren't moving and you know this supposed to be like a rut hunt you know the prime dates of the year and it was just a butt kicker like you know but that happens you know you you some years it's you just freeze it's like polar <laughs> polar ice cap but you know it's the same as the um, uh change you know it's it's another thing the weather changes you just got to adapt and go yeah. on you still got to hunt you still got to hunt uh i always tell people there's something going on you just got to be a part of it you know every day yeah but when it's freaking 80 degrees in the rut that's tough real tough i mean they just lay up they don't move like they should or they do it at night yeah they do it at night and we're not out there obviously mm-hmm yeah, that's the unfortunate thing. But I, I think managing expectations for folks, a lot of people expect, you know, and you watch on TV and everybody's putting down these gorgeous deer, giant deer, and it just looks so easy. And I mean, for me personally, TV. bingo, <laughs> I, I would say the most difficult animal, one of the most difficult animals to get an old mature trophy is, is, would be a white tailed deer. Like, I, I mean, I just think they're so t- tough to kill. I totally agree. I mean, uh, you know, straight up one on one with a white tailed deer, and you know, in the wild is is tough. Yeah. I mean, especially a big mature buck. They mm-hmm. they've seen everything and done everything, yeah. and 
their senses are like nothing else I've ever hunted. No. You know, and you can't see them. You know, you can't sit back and glass them, you know, like you can a lot of other animals. So you no. don't know where, where they're at. No. So. Well, and even, so we're <coughs> driving here on Sunday. Today's Tuesday. We're driving here on Sunday, and you have pictures of that deer that we want to hunt. And I can't, even if I was here, which I could have been, I couldn't have gone in there because the darn wind. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like, okay, well, you know, you have the deer on pattern or you have this going for you. And well, guess what? The the five days that you're here, we don't get the right wind. You're not even touching that stand. Mm -hmm. And that happened to us. What was it? It uh, Two years ago, we I came out here in March. And we went to Missouri and hung all those stands for north winds. Mm-hmm. And then I came in the fall during the rut to hunt. And we had a south wind almost the whole time. Well, the worst is I usually set enough stands for north or south wind that, you know, we can adapt and keep hunting. But the worst is when it's like a steady east wind hits. Like we hardly ever have east wind. Our prevailing wind is southwest. And yeah. um, it's something west. And when you have an east wind... It's just tough, you know. Yeah. Even the deer don't like it. The deer don't, it screws up their travel pattern because they can't smell the way they're wanting to go. Yeah. And it changes everything. Well, tonight is going to be an east wind. <laughs> <laughs> but we only got one day, so we can stand it. But yeah. there's nothing worse than sitting in a hunting camp with six or eight clients with an east wind. Yeah. And they're all like, where do I go? Where do I go? And I'm like, well, there is something worse. Light and variable. That's the worst. Light and variable. Because yeah. then I tell them you can hunt any stand. It don't matter. Same result. Light and variable. It's yeah. going to suck. Yeah. I feel like it's like that when I'm elk hunting too. Like, yeah. I'm like, man, it's morning. The wind should be thermals going down. You know, it's cool. No, no, no. No, it doesn't matter. It, like, Yogi and I elk hunting this year in Oregon, it didn't matter where we went or what we did. The wind was at our back. Mm-hmm. Every time. Like, we would plan a whole stock, like, okay, the wind's going to be this way because it's this time of day, or we leave the truck, it's blowing one way, and inevitably, we're hunting with the wind at our back. And I just, I mean, I just want to throw down my bow and cry and quit, you know, like, <laughs> well, okay, you know, there's a point. <laughs> the wind is king on anything, I think. I've hunted with other outfitters over the years, and they'll be like, oh, the wind don't matter, you know, the wind doesn't make a difference, or these deer don't pay attention to the wind. Oh, I've heard that do. several times. Yeah, I know. And I'm like, whatever. I mean, I don't care what you're hunting, it's... Mm-hmm. It lives by the wind. Yeah. Well, last night we sat out here and there was a doe and her and her baby, they didn't care. They were just hanging out downwind. Another doe and her fawn came in and those ones, those ones were livers. They're going to live. Well, <laughs> they they're, they're one. the ones that get you. Yeah. They caught one, one, one touch of, of our scent and they were gone. Uh, but yeah, those are the ones that get you. Those, yeah. Because the, the deer you're hunting was not there. No. But he knew they were. Yeah. And... Uh, it ruins it yeah. you know, instantly, and this time of year the does are so sensitive. They've you know they've spent whatever the last three months protecting their fawns, so they're on edge you know anyway. And uh, this time of year is the worst because they're just you know they've been fighting off coyotes and yeah. dogs and everything else, and and then here you come and uh, it makes it really tough. Now during the rut. They're trying to hide. Yeah. The last thing they want to do is make noise or, you know, be seen. They're terrified. They're terrified. I don't so blame it, them. The role's reversed, but this time of year, that's why I don't like to hunt mornings. You know, it's it's so hard to get in. You can maybe get in and get by from spooking, not spooking the deer you're hunting, but it's all the others that, that you'll spook that mm-hmm. makes it tough. So we typically just hunt evenings. In the early season like this. Yeah, unless you got a special situation. I mean, there's places that i'll slip in in the morning and um i shot my deer in missouri in the morning last year yeah that's a different place i mean you could slip right in there and yeah it uh, because it was it was the stand was in a bedding area Mm -hmm. so we slipped in when they were out and we were in there waiting for it so yeah that's that's, like i said there's certain situations but in general especially if you're hunting a food source you know cut corn or whatever they're there yeah you can't get in there in the morning Mm -hmm. No, you have to wait for them to come out there in the evening. Mm-hmm. And whitetail, it's so different. You know, there's, it seems like there's a lot of people that will, um, you know, like, like we've done, you know, we hang our stands and this is where, you know, we want to hunt. And then I'll come back to camp and I'm like, David, this deer's, I just ate a bug, by the way, <coughs> just whoever's watching that happened, uh, high protein snacks out here. Um. You know, the buck's moving at 60 yards or 80 yards or whatever. And, and you know, you are really, you're the first person that's like, well, after dinner. Wait, don't, 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 don't tell all the secrets here. This is, 
Oh. It's going to be public. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, the first thing, you're, you're great. You're like, after dinner, we'll go move our stands. Where do you need to be? And, you know, that's one thing, like using OnX, um, you, you know, you're dropping me pins for, for Kansas here, but also in Missouri, you know, I can mark in on X what tree or what location I think we want to hang that stand. And then we go in there in the dark. And when everything's kind of disorienting and weird, you know, I've kind of done my groundwork uh, in my phone. And we can kind of go right to the spot. Two years ago, I think we moved my stand twice in the middle of the night. I mean, Well, you've, just, gotten, you've, you've gotten good at that. I mean, you know, I've had so many hunters, they'll sit in the same tree all week and say, well, I keep seeing the deer over there. Well, let's move. Well, no, I want to sit here. You know, I, I think this is a good spot. But the deer are over there. Yeah. So you've learned that you got to move. I mean, yeah. when we hang stands through the summer, it's a guess. Yeah. You know, and those deer, again, anything can change. Yeah. A tree can fall. It moves them. You know, anything can happen. Well, we've had some spots that, you know, the deer, you know, are pretty consistent with crossing. Um, and, and it seems to be like a generational thing. Um, and we've hung, hung some stands I mean, that we've never actually even sat in because the wind just never worked out for them or I mean, the deer just weren't using that trail the way they had the year before or mm-hmm. whatever. And it's almost better. Like every hunt is brand new. And, and you know, like you'll watch some of these guys, um, you know, like let's say, for example, Lee and Tiffany, you know, they've got some of these farms and they'll pattern a big deer and, and you'll see, you know, Lee on a social media, he'll go hang a stand and he'll kill that deer that night. Mm-hmm. you know he's he's like nope this is where he went in he's going to come out here this is what he's going to do he'll go hang the stand and the first sit is always your best sit the more you walk around and i mean i'm convinced of that 100 percent. even with black bears you know if you want to kill a big black bear your first sit is your best sit because if you climb in there and nothing is right they're going to smell you and nothing will ever go right for you well and they smell you after you leave that's another thing that people don't realize they'll they'll be real scent conscious but your residual scent gets you just as bad yeah. as, as you're being there. Uh, every time you leave, you're leaving a trace. You know, every mm-hmm. time you leave a stand, you're leaving a, a trace. And that deer comes in an hour after you left, he knows you were there. Mm-hmm. And then they, we got to get some spray or something. Oh my goodness. Scratching gracious. like you got fleas. Oh, it's these little black <laughs> bugs. I'm telling I don't you, have they're any. awful. They're all over me. <laughs> David's over here. Yogi looks like he's been shot with a shotgun. He's like peppered with little bug bites. And yeah. <clears throat> well, we've introduced him to oak mites. Is yeah. what it is. But <laughs> he's loving it. Yeah. Yeah. Every minute. And and I'm just as bad with these little black ones. I mean, I got little welts all over me now, and I'm eating them. They're in my nose. <laughs> I mean, whatever. All over. It's part of part of this time of year, I guess. Well, that's why I told you the other night. Uh, a lot of people want to hunt this time of year, but there are a lot of negatives to it the yeah. heat the oak mites the chiggers the seed tick we still got those uh and they're miserable i mean it, it's just yeah. not just the heat it's everything that goes with it but it's also a good time to pattern a deer yeah so which is kind of what we're trying to do <coughs> unless the neighbors cut corn uh, ruins my hunt tonight we'll find out in about you know three hours four hours we'll, <laughs> we'll know the end of this <laughs> story but you know that's i mean i as little as i know about whitetail hunting that the everything i know has come from you and and i am a firm believer of of not being you know having my heart set on one spot um and that you know being able to move now i'm not i'm not capable of hanging i don't hang uh those climbing sticks and then go hang off the tree in the dark i mean I, that's just out of my wheelhouse and and i accept my limitation on that um, but man you got to have somebody with you that can and so i've been really fortunate um that you and my uh cameraman nick are real good at you know being able to get that done and in and, and it's not just one stand we have to hang we're hanging two so it's a double pane yeah. and then camera arms you know <laughs> it's like you're out there forever hanging stands and moving and uh but that is one thing i've learned about you is i mean that one year you hung a stand 10 feet off the ground and shot a giant well i was just getting right that just popped into my head that was a, <clears throat> a new year's eve deer and i'd hunted that deer i think i had on it nine nine sets and i moved my stand seven times and then I finally shot him at 103 fever that night, and I walked in, and I knew where he was going to come out, or I thought. And I looked at that tree, and I was like, I just can't do it, you know. And You were sick. <clears throat> I was sick, sick. And uh, so I walked over into a little cluster of hackberries, and I, it wasn't even 10 feet. It was like 4 feet 
off the ground. I put in two tree steps, and I was like, I'm done. I hung the little, I think it was a loggy bayou stand, and um, sure enough, all the deer come out where I should have been. Mm-hmm. But he was late, and he, when all the deer were out there, he saw them, and he cut the corner, and I shot him. Um, but, yeah, I moved it seven times, I think, in nine sets. Yeah, it's so, insane. Yeah, and I never realized till there was a real open place how the deer use the nose to enter and exit a field. I mm-hmm. mean, if the wind was out of the northwest, they came out here. If it was out of the southwest, they came out here. I mean, they really shifted. And there was probably, I don't know, 50, 60 deer hitting that field every night. So you got to really watch them. You know, mm-hmm. it was pretty cool. But it's hard to get one deer out of 50 or 60. Yeah. So... Yeah, you learn a lot of yeah, hard it lessons was, that it was way. was neat. That was like me elk season. We had one bull bugling, and I thought, well, I got a chance at this guy. At most, he's going to need four, one. He's only going to have four or five cows with them. <laughs> you know, we got in on them, Yogi and I, and there was like 50 head. And there's this little toe headed five by five just screaming his head off. And half the herd smelled us, the other half didn't. Enough to cause chaos, needless to say, did not get a shot. <laughs> It's like, okay. Well, well, you never know. I mean, well, and then go. 50 animals, right? Like, you don't, I mean, that's a lot of elk. That's but a lot. But they live by their nose, like you say. You just, and then getting in and tricking that many eyes and ears. And those does are the worst. They will drill a hole in you in the tree staring at you. And, you know, you'd be pinned down for half an hour easy. It's nothing for them. They don't care. Yeah, we had a, a farm years ago, me and my buddy. We hunted it, and there was a deer, a doe there with a broken ear. <clears throat> and this food plot was about five acres, I'd say, kind of in a hourglass kidney-shaped deal. And it didn't matter what stand you was in. She come in the field, and she stomped her way around that field till she found you. No way. I mean, it didn't matter. And I told Ralph, my yeah, buddy. Yeah, shoot her. I said, I'm going to kill her. And we don't shoot does, typically. You know that. Well, maybe. yeah. And um, so <laughs> it was the hardest deer I think I ever hunted. <laughs> and I finally went down there. It was the uh, you know, the late rifle season for does or whatever, and I shot her with a rifle at like 250 yards. And I was so happy. I was happier than if I'd shot a 180. Uh, but she literally treed you no matter where you was at in that field. So they get trained, I guess, just like anything else. But, yeah, they're smart. Whew. That's how they stay alive. Yeah, yeah. And I think they pass that on, you know, because oh, yeah. their little fawns were acting the same way. You know, by the time the fall came around, they were acting just like her. So. Yeah, we had the smart fawn last night that came in before sh- her mom did. And that little thing was spooky and jumpy. And the other fawn with the other doe, uh, they were just stupid. They're like, la, 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 we're just eating. Yeah, <laughs> you get away with anything. Yeah. yeah. And the other ones, that little fawn, Yogi looks at me and he's like, this fawn is like so spooky and then her mom came in i was like well uh, i can tell you where she gets it mm-hmm. you know uh it is pretty interesting the generational uh things that they learn you know an elephant takes five years to learn all the food it can eat from its mom really they eat so much food it takes them five years to learn all the food they can mm. eat and i think deer do the same thing you know they spend the entire time there with that fawn teaching them whatever i mean it's the same with people yeah. Same with people. But it's very interesting being out here. So, you know, I, I think for me, the biggest takeaway hunting with you is is get in, get out, shut up. <laughs> shut up. I mean, shut up. <laughs> don't introduce anything <clears throat> new. If they're not used to it, don't put it out there. You know, well, only, you the know other keep thing, things consistent. The other thing is I always say is there's so many variables out there. There's, you know, there's the controllable variables and the uncontrollable variables. And I think the best thing somebody can do if they're going on a hunt like this is for sure control the controllable ones. You know, you're, you can't control the wind or the yeah. rain or weather or whatever, uh, but you can control the arrow clinking on your bow riser or, uh, mm. you know, your face mask, you know, hitting your bow when you shoot or your arm, you know, your bow hitting your mm-hmm. arm. You know, practice with your stuff and try to eliminate, there's an eagle, uh, yeah. eliminate all the... Um, controllable variables you know you can practice that stuff at home you Mm -hmm. know practice shooting out of a tree stand practice shooting out of a blind and you know so you don't shoot the blind when the deer comes out or whatever i mean uh and so many guys they don't get that you know Mm -hmm. they come on a big hunt they got all this cool equipment never used it you know so i think that's a big thing and you do you shoot a lot all the time which i I try to but i mean it's still everybody (coughs) gets excited and you know i've learned some really tough lessons out here um 
you know, having a real hard time, you know, for me, uh, one of, I think one of my biggest things is picking a pin. Well, you know, I, when you're on a deer and they're so close and all your pins are on the deer and all your pins are also covering up the deer, it was really hard for me to pick a spot. And so, you know, David, now you've talked to me to go in single pin and um, we'll see how that works out for me this year. But <laughs> Well, that's a common uh, problem. A lot of people, uh, yeah. they shoot multiple pins and you can. I mean, you obviously can. you can, yeah. but in the heat of the moment, it's easy to, you know, get excited and you know you think your pins on it and all the pins are on them all the pins, all are, the pins are there <laughs> typically your deer is shot at 20 25 yards yeah. well the middle of your pin gap or pin housing is 40 yeah and so you hit them in the loin it's a it's like i said it's a common problem so i think going to the one pin is going to help you especially yeah. that new site i mean it's going to really help and you. running the new digital react one and yeah. the nice thing i like about that it's not legal in every state. It's legal here. Mm -hmm. So if my buck is at 20, I'm at 20. If it's 25, I dial 25. I'm not gapping pins anymore, guessing. Um, and even the traditional React one, you can you can do the same thing. It's just not digitized. Um, but that's, that's <coughs> pretty handy. Like yesterday we were shooting. We shot 20, 25, 30, and then 40. And we shot out to uh, 50. Um, and it, I mean, you, you dial that and it's on, you know, one thing I've shot gap pins my whole life. I mean, usually I usually shoot a seven pin, you know, seven fixed pins and, uh, I always could gap shoot, you know, if it was 23, I'd hold the 20 a little higher or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but I was amazed with this digital site. It's as how much difference two yards can make. Oh, huge. I mean, even with me, I'm shooting 300 feet per second. But even still, two yards makes a difference in that digital sight. You can dial. If it's 33, you dial 33. That's right. And then if you're off a little bit on your hold, you're still good. You're it's in way the center more forgiving. The, yeah, you're in the center of the animal, and you're not off that two yards. And then you aimed a little wrong, which can put you off four or five yards, and it's bad. Yeah, pretty soon you're missing. One of the other things I learned, uh, unfortunately, with you, I show up out here with, um, with really heavy arrows, like... <laughs> Was it, they were 50, 60, 70 grains heavier than I'm shooting now. So they're like 450 grain arrows. And the first thing you do is literally you thump me in my forehead. And you're like, bah, bah, bah. you're like, you idiot. Well, I didn't say idiot. Yeah, you did. Maybe I did. You did. Don't, don't try to make <laughs> yourself sound nicer than you are. I mean, this you're real. Uh, you're like, you idiot. And you thump my forehead and you're like, what do you need a heavy arrow like that? You're not shooting a freaking Cape Buffalo. You're <laughs> shooting a little old white tailed deer. And you're like, you're going to go out here and you're going to be off five yards on your shot and you're going to freaking miss it. Da, da, da. What did you do? You jinxed me, David. That's what you did. You jinxed me. <laughs> no, I told me. you the truth. And yeah. And that's exactly what happened, you guys. I had the one of the biggest deer I've ever shot at, Whitetail. Really cool buck. White with some weird, I don't know if he had like rotten velvet on his horns he didn't shed off or something. But it, just a cool buck. I saw him the first night out of range. Last night, we moved the stand three times. Three times. And this deer finally came underneath me right at dark, like right at last shooting light. And he had me pinned for like a half an hour before, you know, the last half hour of daylight just had me pinned. And I shoot at him, and I think he's 30 yards, and he's 25. And sure enough, my arrow literally shaved the top of his back. <laughs> awful, 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 awful. So I lightened my arrows last year a little, but almost not enough, because I had the same kind of thing happen last year. And I same 30 yards comes into 25, and I, I got the deer, but it, the, the shot was a little high. That deer probably dropped a little bit too, though. Yeah, but, but regardless, shot was a result. little high. Same. This one was a fatal result, which was positive. So this year, <laughs> I lightened them even more. And what I did, and I know there's so many philosophies on how heavy your arrows should be, da 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 I sat down with Chuck Adams and John Linnae from Bear Archery. And you didn't I, believe me, I'd ask Chuck. Well, no, but <laughs> <laughs> what I did was I said, okay, look, at this is my this is my arrow I'm shooting how much energy do I need for elk hunting? And we figured it out to where I had exactly uh, 50 pounds of energy. And Chuck said, any elk you're going to kill with that much energy. So, um, okay. So this year I came out with light, the lightest arrows I've ever come out here with. 
uh, with the goal that if I make that human error of, okay, well, I just ranged the bucket 30 yards, he takes three or four steps. You don't really think much about it in the time, it's right? A lot, it's, though. you know, but heck, it can make a huge difference. So now I'm, you know, running a little bit lighter arrows. I've got the single pin, which will force me to range, gives me one aiming point to where you're not, you know, looking at so many pins and kind of getting lost in, in, you know, you get all the pins on the deer. It's really easy to be like, oh, easy day. Well, where were you holding? What was the spot? Well, my pins were on them. Well, which one were you using exactly? <laughs> hey, you got five. How many? <laughs> you got five. Yeah. <laughs> were you focused on your 20? Were you focused on your 30? Were you focused on your 40? Can you honestly say that you know exactly you were on? You know what I mean? Like, it's just so much. It happens so quick, and these deer are so close. And I I mean, I get so flippin' excited. Last year, Yogi's <laughs> in the stand with me. And the deer start chasing. I started shaking so hard. He's like, you're shaking the camera. I had to stand up and like lock out my knees because I was shaking so hard that uh, the whole tree stand was moving. Well, it's uh, ridiculous. The light arrow versus heavy is a long time controversy. I mean, it's been going forever. But, you know, you think about all the animals that you shot over the years. <clears throat> uh, did you ever not kill one because of not enough penetration? No. No, it's all about placement. So if you place, you know, the arrow in the right spot, it doesn't take a lot of energy yeah. to do it. I mean, back in the early days, they strive for 40, 45 foot pounds right. of, of energy for like elk and moose. Yeah. Well, now you can't hardly get a bow if it's splined right to the weight uh, and you got a 26 to 28 inch draw length, you're going to shoot over 50 foot pounds energy. That's right. So you don't need that big heavy arrow. Yeah. At least that's my opinion. Yeah. A lot of people will argue that, but <clears throat> uh, in my opinion, I'd rather have a 350 to 400 grain arrow flying flatter yeah. than a 550 grain arrow arcing yeah. in. So it's just, it, to me, that's my opinion anyway. Well, and the other thing I did this year is I moved my peep height up. Um. And with doing that, I have been able to extend my range and practice more. But in doing that with the kisser button, it actually gave me an extra inch on my draw length, which that extra inch gave me a tremendous amount of speed. So I figure every pound, what I was averaging is every pound I would add to my draw weight was only three um, feet a second on the speed. Well, the, the biggest turnover you can really do is try to increase your draw length. Because um, when I'm whitetail hunting, I don't want, you know, a 60-pound, 60 62-pound draw weight. Because I'm freezing my butt off. I can't hardly move, let alone draw, you know, that heavy of a poundage. So um, I can get away with less poundage for these, you know, whitetail hunts where I'm really sitting. And, and now, hopefully, you know, also have gained some speed. We were at TAC, and I, I took that React 1, and I... Entered in my chronograph speed of my arrow, and we trued it up, and I shot, I was shooting 83 yards, no problem. I've never shot 83 really? yards in, with my bow in my life. And then I even hit the 95-yard target doing a guessing holdover. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, 83 yards for me, heck, that was unheard of. I mean, I've had bows that I've maxed out at 60 yards, you know, and, and you know, you want to practice as far out as you can so those close shots seem so darn easy, well, you know. And that's what I do all the time. I practice a lot at, you know, out to 100 yards and then even further at times. But when you do get a deer at 20, it makes it a whole a lot, lot easier, easier shot, you know. And, and at that distance, you develop better form. Yeah. Because if you're off just a little bit, it shows a lot. Mm-hmm. So it makes a lot of sense. And that sight <clears throat> allows you to do that. Oh, yeah. I mean, in just a few minutes, about anybody that's shooting well at all can be shooting at that distance. Yeah, as long as your fundamentals are consistent. Yeah. Um, you know, you can you can dial in that thing. I just, the sight I brought here, I just ripped off um, my bow that I was shooting last year and um my refine and put it on this one because i wanted a single pin and and um the speeds are almost the same we trued it up yesterday uh this bow is a, i'm shooting now which i can't talk about it quite yet but um <laughs> what how fast are you shooting now do you know about 263 yeah, that's pretty good um and it was uh, my 52 is what took me to hit it in the center at 50 so I, all you have to do in is go into that site and then say hey 
this where it says 52 note this is 50 yards and it auto corrects everything for you and then after I did that we walked it back down and, and shot my yardages at 20 25 30 and 40 and uh, I mean it just makes it so easy you know you're not spending a week a lot of people no, are like, I oh, my gosh. Spend, you... I used to take all summer to get my pins exactly know, right. I know, right? Because you're, you like, trying to something, move them. And then you got to go back and do it all again. I I actually look now at a lot of these guys that are shooting out west, and they're shooting other sites where they have to, you know, fool with the tape and all that and stuff. And the micro, you got to yeah. take and move those little yeah. pins with your fingers. <laughs> yeah. And you accidentally slide it because it sticks, and you slide it down mm-hmm. a quarter inch, and you're just... Oh, you have no idea where you even started. Yep. And then I've had oh. one time I had my marks all marked, and then I hunted in the rain and Gone. washed them all off. So yeah, that that thing has changed the way sights you know work. I mean, it's it's pretty incredible. Well, whether you're running the React technology or the digital React technology, it's the same basis Principle. of technology. Yeah, just the digital one. The only thing it really does is it gives you that digital readout, and you enter your speed. Um, you do have to have a minimum speed. I think a lot of that technology, the minimum speed on it is around 260 feet a second. So mm-hmm. for me, you know, you know, getting that extra length on my draw and doing it, it's just a game changer. It's just, this technology has changed archery so much. Um, you know, the technology has changed hunting though. I mean, everything yeah. about it is, you know, the cameras, the bows, the, the sights that we have, yeah. the range finders. I mean, you think about all the change that has come about in the last 30 years. Yeah. I mean, it's come a long way. Tremendous. Ways. Cellular yeah. cameras now. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. There's even, you know, like some of the cameras now have live mode. Yeah. So I can turn the phone on at 630 and see what's there. And just watch it. Yeah, just watch it. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's unreal. See, that's not legal in Wyoming. I was just getting ready to say that. Yeah. Now they outlawed it in Wyoming and yeah. Arizona. Mm-hmm. There's several states. Utah, I think. Yeah, yep. there's quite a few. Um, in Oregon, they were still running it. There was someone that was running... <laughs> Yogi and I, I'm like, oh, this is a good spot. I like hunting here, and this is a good ridge. And there's always bulls on the ridge, right? So we're walking along, and I, the ones, I'm like, let's set up in this little spot right here and do a call set. And we sure enough break over to do a call set. And some dude has has brought in a ground blind in like 300 pounds of alfalfa, and he's wow. running cellular cameras and like in I, Oregon, yeah. Like, what the heck is going on here? It's like, like, okay, well, I I guess we're not the only one that likes this spot, but holy smokes, like, that's just, you know, like, I didn't even go back to that spot the rest of the season because I didn't want Fish and Game to be like, what are you doing, be your luck, doing be- in here? Well, and I think, you know, I mean, some of that stuff, it's not that they were doing anything illegal apart from driving it in on a quad, you know, on a closed road, right? Like, um, So you can bait out there? Yeah, you can bait for deer really? elk, yeah. Yeah, but you can't, you can't drive a closed road, right? Like, even on our e-bikes, we were taking the batteries out and putting them in our backpack on the closed roads. That's what I did in New Mexico. Yeah. I took my battery and out. And pedaled them, which sucked because I'm like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> this is a heavy bicycle. <laughs> like, <laughs> This yeah, is I a lot of work. I didn't take my battery out. Yeah, no, we did on the closed <laughs> roads, and then when we would get on the open roads, then we would put the batteries back in and ride. But, um, you know, the last thing you want to do is, well, I didn't have it turned on. No, mm. I don't have a battery in it, you know, and then there's no question. You have the battery out, there's, you know, you're... Um, but, but that's another technology that's changed. Think about that. Yeah. The e-bikes. Yeah. I mean, we'd be lost without them now. I mean, well, I shouldn't say You lost. would, yeah. I would be. Yeah. I mean, they're I'm, not legal in Wyoming either in road closures. Really? No. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. Hmm. We can ride them closed. in New Mexico, but uh, you know they used to outrun us going up the mountain. You know, and now we can keep up with the elk. Yeah. So it's been a game changer there. I now get in I, front of them. Now that I've got it, I mean, I can't imagine hunting without it. Yeah. You know. Well, especially as we get older. Well, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm going to point out the obvious, but I used to think that I could outrun an elk. Well, I, now I'm pretty certain I can't. Yeah. So ninety nine point nine percent sure yeah. it's not happening. Yeah. yeah, unless I'm on a bike, and then it's even questionable. Mm, they're so. fast. I always tell people, you know, you don't want to be calling to their backs because they're not coming back for you, and uh, getting in front of them is <laughs> good luck. You know, that's another thing about whitetail hunting. I always, you know, after spending ten days, two weeks out there chasing elk, it's kind of nice to come back and sit in a stand. Yeah. I mean, despite the oak mites and the, the all the stuff that's biting bugs, my arms yeah. and eating me up right now. But yeah. I I haven't done it yet this year. But I always look forward to that first set after I come back from New Mexico. Mm-hmm. I, I'm like, I can't wait to just set in a stand mm-hmm. and see something walk by. But 
Uh, but then, and then you talk to David in December, he'll be like, I can't wait to go to Mexico. <laughs> no, I, know, I know. Get a margarita in my hand yeah. and sit by the pool. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's uh, a season when you hunt really hard. I mean, it wears on you, yeah. you know, so I always look forward to that last hunt, um, which it really never comes. No, sure. there's no such thing. No, but, you know, you get a little break there in December, January. and Trade and, shows. Yeah, and uh, you get to regroup and. As soon as it's over, you're wishing you could go back and mm-hmm. start over. But yeah, it is. I uh, it always sa- is sad when it's over. You know, you you look forward to all these tags and all these hunts, and and then it's done. It always comes and goes so quick. And the older we get, the faster, the faster it goes. You know, that's no kidding. I mean, <laughs> it, it. You know, our parents used to tell us that. You know, yeah. well, you get older, you get the faster time goes. Well, it really does. It sure does. So yeah, I'm re- booking hunts now. I'll be sixty that I go on. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's unreal. I booked a hunt <coughs> this year, 2022, for 2024, or was that 2025 we're going sheep hunting? 24? Yeah, that's 25. Neat. 2025. Yeah. So I'm, I booked a sheep hunt for 2025. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd be 61 then. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. But, you know, the thing is, is they're not getting any cheaper. No. So I'm like, well, what am I going to be doing in 2025? I'm going to be wishing I was sheep hunting and the price is going to be 15 or 20 grand more. I knew a guy in the early, let's see, late 80s, early 90s. He uh, was a builder. He built a house kind of on the side and sold it for like 100 grand. I don't remember the number. But he took all that money to go towards the Super Slam. And he killed it. He killed the Super Slam. And we all thought he was crazy. But mm. now, I mean, just think about what a super slam the would cost. The value of that. Yeah. I mean, it'd be ridiculous. I, I mean, I don't know what it would It had to be yeah. quarter million maybe or mm-hmm. more. So he had yeah. a good value on his money. Well, and it's good to, you know, um, give, save, spend, right? Like that's the that's the philosophy with money. There's only three things you can do with it. You give it away, you spend it, or you save it. And, you know... Man, I, I, I'm getting to, you know, I'm middle-aged now, and I'm getting to that point where it's like, uh, I don't want to wait until I'm 65 to start doing the things that I want to do. I'm saving for it now um, so that I can spend my life <laughs> doing the things I love. Well, they and, say you spend way more in the first half than you do the second half. So yeah. if that's any consolation, that's why I've always looked at things. I mean, yeah. hopefully I'll need less money when I'm too old to do anything. Yeah. But now yeah. I like to go and do yeah. So, yeah, well, you and I are kind of like at the race for things like you beat me to the leopard punch. <laughs> Thanks, David. Yeah, that was a lucky one. And that's next year. I'm doing <laughs> that. Um, but uh, and then, you know, we're both wanting to do the brown bear thing. Neither one of us have done it yet. But well, I've done it. But, but not the way I want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> probably the toughest one I've ever been on. I got to say that. But I'm going back for more of it next year, I guess. So we'll yeah. see. Yeah, and I've heard that from other people, that it's just an absolute grind. Yeah, it's just the country that it's in, you know. I mean, you've been there. I mean, it's just brutal. Everything about it is tough. Yeah, I still have it on the list. I don't have it on the short list right now because it's not booked, but... um I got well, don't my, wait till you're 60. Well, and I've got, <laughs> <laughs> I've got that uh, you know, leopard this year uh, for 2023, 2024. I'm looking doing uh, Mozambique free range Cape Buffalo. 2025 is the sheep, so maybe 26 or 27, but boy, I mean, look at how fast, boom, 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 I'm almost 50 years old. <laughs> you know well, what I, I mean? Said, I'll be, like, I, I, just, I couldn't believe it. I have it. to get after this stuff right now. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when we were talking about that sheep hunt uh, in 24, it'd be 60. Yeah. I mean, that's like old to me. Seems old. Yeah, well, we... I don't really feel, I kind of feel old, I guess, at some point, but not as old as... I thought 60 was. Yeah. Well, it's also why we enjoy these Midwest white hunts too. Mm-hmm. Just going to kick back in a tree and relax and, you know, just, you're just part of the environment. You are not in the environment. You know, you're just, you're just there. You just take it all in, you know, and that's the nice thing about doing this type of hunting. And it's why I always come back, you know, you and Cindy, you know, you're, you welcome us into your home and you have a beautiful place and, and the food is good and the company is marginal on your side, but, uh, <laughs> Cindy's great. Uh, and we just come here and, and we see lots of deer and I mean, heck, t- a few, I don't know, three or four years ago, I sat a stand for nine days. I, on the first day of the hunt, I saw like a mid one fifties, a mid one sixty, 
and I had the first night like a 135 inch five year old oh, nine point walk yep. underneath me, and I didn't shoot it. And David, <laughs> right on the forehead, <laughs> what's wrong with you? Why didn't you shoot that deer? I'm like, David, I saw, I saw 160. I saw mid this one that wide short time 150 something mm-hmm. buck that oh, he, nobody we never got him. Uh, and I sat for nine days and I ended up shooting a different deer during gun season. The next day your buddy goes in there and shoots that 160. <laughs> it's like, ah. Yeah. And you probably could have killed that deer with a bow that day. Uh, it's just I insane. Mean, you yeah. just don't know. You know what I mean? That's why like you're, like you say, you just have to be in the stand and be out here. And when you only have five days, man, it's really tough to get lucky. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, that's, that's the frustrating part too, as an outfitter is you want them to be successful yeah. so bad. But it can be really hard. Yeah. I'm just thankful to come out here. I love coming out here and, you know, learn something new every year and, and hopefully, you know, become a better bow hunter. And, and uh, I think you have. You've evolved pretty pretty far from where you started. I mean, it's yeah. it's hard. Yeah, I didn't have I mean, a clue. we grew up with it. Yeah. You know, we grew up with them, so it's different. But uh, just walking in, that's the one thing I like about traveling and hunting is that, you get new experiences, yeah. you know, I mean, as an adult, you know, like <clears throat> I always tell people about Africa, you know, like the first time I went over there, it was almost like the first time I ever hunted because yeah. you get up in the morning and all those birds and different sounds and smells and you don't know what anything is. And it's like, you know, that's the way I was when I was six years old and, you know, I went out with my grandpa and I, mean, I didn't know what anything was. Well, so. Yogi thought he had bed, bite, bed <laughs> bugs. It turns out they're oak mites. We we're like, oh, what is this? <laughs> what is going on but, in this You know, body? that's a part of the experience. I mean, now you know. You can tell your grandkids, once upon a time, I was in Kansas and I got oak mites. And, I mean, it's part of the experience. You grandkids. Know. Grand is, dogs. Well, you know what I mean. I mean, it uh, it's the experience. Yeah. That's what makes it cool. The trophies are, you know, cool too. But the experience, I mean... Uh, That's pretty awesome. Well, and I've seen some incredible deer. And that's, you know, that's the other thing for me that keeps me coming back. Those big deer, you know, they might not walk under your stand this year. But, oh, my, there's some deer, you know, we watched for for years. And I'd be like, man, I I hope that deer's back. And you'd see him the next year. And if you had a gun in your hand, it would have been easy, you know. Mm -hmm. And and you're sitting there with a bow. And you're like, uh, you know. Gun season starts in four days. Do you want to come back, please? <laughs> <laughs> they don't. Just like, ah. Well, that's what I was going to say. Everybody says, well, it would be way easier with a gun. But you've seen that, too. Oh, yeah. Those deer change. It's oh, just like, like there's a switch goes off, and when the gun season opens, it's not bow season anymore. No, it's not. And they know it. So. No. Well, that you, someone starts shooting at you. You know things have changed also. Well, it's not just the shooting. It's yeah, I the, know. The Everything. side-by-sides coming in, the pickup door slamming, the flashlights walking up the creek, and those deer instantly adapt to that and they know yeah. it's that time so it makes it tough yeah we and i really try to listen to you when you talk about you know when we go to the stand in the morning you know where start leave the car cold try not to break yeah. a sweat when you go yeah. in there i throw all my clothes in my backpack at the bottom of the tree i put my clothes on um i wear rubber boots not now but in in the winter i wear rubber boots and and i walk the same path in and out and i try not to touch anything you know, just really try to contain how much exposure I do to an area or give to an area. Um, it's less, it's less that you, the less that you can molest the landscape with yourself, the, the better chance you have, I think of yeah. being successful. And I try really hard to stick to that, um, you know, and, and just really be over the top about it. Well, I always <clears throat> say, if you can stay, uh, warm through the day, your chances go way up. Yep. You know, a lot, so many guys freeze out at nine o'clock and mm. they miss the best part of the yeah. day, you know, so. Well, we sit dark to dark. <clears throat> you do. I'm pretty proud of you for that. And that's, Most grown men can't do that. Oh, and it's, it's rough. You know, my cameraman, when I'm going to the restroom out the tree, was, gets a deal. We get real <laughs> close. It's different now with my husband. It's a lot easier. Well, I don't really care either way, but <laughs> the cameramen usually do. <laughs> Poor guys. Uh, Nick, I peed on his stuff one time because he <laughs> made the mistake of dropping like a camera bag in the dark. And he's like looking at it down there. And when later on, you know, when I had to go, I just looked at him. I'm like, man, sorry, sorry. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. And then there's some people like, oh, my gosh, you can't pee out of a tree. I have called in deer peeing, I swear to God. <laughs> like, it's a thing. Last year, Yogi and I were at the stand at Anthony's. We were gun hunting. And, I mean, I had to go. It was like 911. 
And Yogi's like, well, I mean, it wasn't one I could do out of the tree. I had to get on the <laughs> ground. <laughs> this, is, this is the uncut part of the podcast, <laughs> David. So I get on the ground and Yogi's like, well, you better bring your gun. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to bring my gun. I get on the ground and I do my business and I look up and there's a buck. He comes running to the edge of the that field behind Anthony's gun stand and he's looking at me and he's just watching me. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm glad this isn't a big buck, number one. But also... The deer clearly knows I'm a woman. My pants are down, and he's watching me. I get I get everything done, put my pants up. I grab my gun. I climb up the ladder stand, get in the stand, and I hit my rattling horns, and the deer comes in. Really? <laughs> I was just, that's the stupidest thing in the world. Like, And I had that happen with Nick on my first hunt with you before I would uh, be brave enough to just pee off the stand. I got down one day and went to the bathroom at the base of the tree and then climbed back up. Sure enough, a buck comes right in. And, you know, and then people, I, I mean, maybe I get away with it because I'm a girl. No, I don't think the deer relate that scent. I mean, I think it's a... This I've is heard, a gross topic. I'm well, know, sorry, you guys, with this. <laughs> but it's a it's a natural thing. But I mean, people I, wonder. Yeah, I think that um, deer don't relate that to fear for some reason. I don't, I don't know, know if it's they say it turns to ammonia instantly, and I don't know. I mean, I, I've know. never. I can't sit dark to dark and not pee, yeah. and I can't go. I'm not doing that she wee thing. I'm not going in a bottle. I just go, and you know. Maybe that's ruined my life for whitetail deer hunting. And there's probably people listening that are like, this woman oh, is an idiot. Oh, 100%. You know? There will be critics. But, I mean, it. like I said, I've never, I can honestly say I've been hunting whitetail my whole life. I can honestly say I've never had it spook a deer. Yeah. Now, I'll say that it doesn't, but I've never seen well, it. Well, I've seen your trophy room, so I'm yeah. going to take what you say. <laughs> And I'm going to run with that and not worry about it. But yeah, it is, I, I mean, it's kind of funny. You know, some people get you know, pretty intense, but we do try to practice good hygiene and low yeah. scent and, and, you know. I think having, you know, being as scent free as you can yeah. really helps with the residual scent. Yeah. I think that sometimes, you know, the, you know, there's nothing you can do. No. I mean, a deer can smell, you know, incredible. So they're going to smell you if they're downwind. Yeah. But you can reduce the impact of that residual scent big time. Well, yeah, and, you know, I've been using dead downwind for years, and I wash my clothes in it. It's got to make a difference. I mean, well, and I do my hair in it, and I'll tell you, like, I, when I'm in town after I've been scent free, like, with my shampoo and my clothes, and I smell a woman or a man, and they're all done up, they stink. No, oh, come I'm on. I'm like, come <laughs> on. Do you have, do you smell so bad? In reality, they're saying the same thing about you. Do you smell so <laughs> bad that you have to put that many layers of like disguise on, like your hair smells, your body smells, and then you're going to put, you know, laundry detergent on, and then you have cologne that it smells like, well, they used to call that toilet water, right? I mean, come on, like this toilet, well, they call it toilet water so you didn't have to have a shower because you stink like poo. Mm. And I'm telling you right now, I can't stand smelling people after hunting season. And I don't, I mean, I'm really almost anti-fragrance. I mean, my lotions don't have fragrance because your body absorbs that stuff. And I've tried to be really fragrance free kind of just from a health standpoint, but holy smokes, no wonder deer smell us a mile away when you smell like, uh, yeah, <laughs> Yeah, you gotta you gotta get rid of that as much as you can. Well, that explains a lot. Well, it does. <laughs> does it explains why I was single for so long. <laughs> well, this woman stinks. Also, uh, she pees out of the tree stand <laughs> and she smells like body odor. Mm. Okay, no, <laughs> but uh, no, I I uh, yeah, I mean, we really try to be as careful as we can. But you know, you're you know, we're we're humans, and there's things that you you know you just can't get rid of. But um, yeah. That's the first quiet moment we've had in. Yeah, I was just sitting here thinking about it, but yeah, the deer's nose is hard to hard to fool. I mean, you got to do everything you can, and and then, like I said, if they get downwind of you, they're probably going to smell you. The other thing that we contend with right now is acorns. Yeah, that's acorns a, dropping. A buddy of mine just sent me a picture today of a, a place there in northern Missouri, and it, the the ground. I mean, they were this deep on the ground. I've never seen anything like it. I'm anxious to get home and check them. I think. It's a little early for them to drop that bad. I think it's from the drought. Oh. It's been so dry. I think the trees are saving themselves by dropping the, yeah. the fruit. But uh, I bet money they're hollow. Yeah. I bet they didn't mature. But I'm anxious to get home and check them. But it's been so dry out here. I, I planted In Colorado, these. they <coughs> had acorns. And the black bears 
poop was full of really? acorn seeds. Oh. See, we didn't have any in yeah. New Mexico this yeah. year, but here I've never seen acorns like there are this year. And it's weird because it's been so dry. You, you think they think. wouldn't have made, but they, they put on. But I just don't know if there's anything in them. So, yeah, and they drop usually, what, mid-September, 1st well, of October? Well, they start, they start dropping like now. About, yeah. the, about the third week of September, you'll see a little bit. But now, I mean, like they're dropping them all, just mm-hmm. boom. And uh, that's not normal. So I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to check it and see. But we haven't had rain. I had, We had three-tenths of an inch of rain the whole time I was gone. And the, the food plots I drilled, it's like I just did it. I mean, they're, they've been sitting there for three weeks and nothing. nothing's grown. Yeah, it's incredible dry. And you can go about 40 miles north, and it's it's green. Everything's got wet. But we've been in a pocket just like it just yeah. can't rain. It's so dry here in Kansas. I've never seen it. It's terrible. Yeah, I've never seen it look And this the dry. hurricanes, we normally get hurricanes this time of year that will bring moisture up, but they're all going to the east. You know, mm. they're hitting Florida now, and we're not going to get any of that. And uh, they're either going east or they're going west. Yeah. I mean, it's like the whole gulf hasn't been hit. Yeah. So we need rain in the worst way. And I was worried about EHD. A lot of the times when it's this dry, we'll start having deer, you know, come out with EHD. And I haven't heard of any yet here in this area. It hit Illinois pretty bad and then uh, some in Iowa, but I haven't heard any here yet. Yeah. So. Well, we, uh, I'm excited. Hopefully we'll have a part two of this podcast where we can come back and talk about it. Yeah, well, we, I mean, <laughs> one way or another, we'll either, you know, get that deer tonight or we'll be podcasting again in November talking about our hunting season and how it turned out. And Because I've got Kansas and Missouri. I get to hunt with you this year. And and um, last year I took my Missouri deer early season, like right now, and I didn't get to hunt. It was the, the same week, wasn't it? Was it was the same week, yeah. and I didn't get to hunt the rut. And so that was kind of heartbreaking for me because I really love whitetail hunting during the rut. Um but I did get it. I hunted that. Uh, did you watch the episode I sent you yesterday? Mm-hmm. Of course you didn't. <laughs> I had this. I'm sitting in this stand and a big like 150 inch deer runs out. Won't stop. Then he comes out of the trees and there's one tiny limb that we keep for cover. Because if you move to the right where Yogi was sitting in the stand, you can see the whole field. Where I'm sitting, you get the leaves right in your in your optic and that's all you can see. And that deer comes out just long enough for me and Yogi to be like, oh, he's back out. And I slide over to where Yogi is, and I go to try to shoot him, and he's gone. Never saw him again. Deer's gun hunting? Yeah. Oh. It was last year. Yeah. The video of him, the buck is beautiful. Would have been my biggest whitetail here. Um, gorgeous buck. That's, it's <laughs> that's hard. a whitetail hunting. And the thing is, is when he was running across the field, I was like, ah. Uh, uh. And I was grunting, and David's like, "You idiot! You gotta whistle at him." That's where he goes and hits me in the forehead. Now I know you. When a whitetail buck is chasing, it's almost impossible to stop them when their nose is up a doe's derriere. Like they are yeah, going. You just, like you gotta scream at them. Yep, just holler at them. And she lost him in the timber, and he kicked back out. But he was at the far end of the field by that pond on the left side. And he comes out just long enough for Yogi to be like, here's the deer, here's the deer. And I throw my gun up, and I can't see, and then I'm trying to slide over. It just happens so quick. I mean, literally, like, the buck of your dreams is in and out, done. Mm-hmm. Game over. You're not seeing him again. Yeah, most people don't realize that either. That's another thing about being familiar with your equipment. Yeah. you got to get on it quick because you don't have a lot of time. Well, and I'm not messing around, you know. Like, I'm pretty prepared. Um but it's still, you know, you take something like just that one spot where he came out with that little limb. And it just had enough leaves on it to where I threw my gun up thinking I'm going to have full field of view. And just, no, you know, I mean, that, and, but you can't, you can't be in a tree that has nothing around you. No. I mean, you got, there's, you got to find that hole. And you got to hope that the deer gives you long enough in that hole to make it count. Well, and usually they will. I mean, yeah. that's one they have But this guys, one was chasing. Yeah, I mean, that's he a little different. Going. But typically guys... I've had so many guys come in and say, well, you know, the, there's no shooting lanes. Well, there is. Yeah. You just got to be patient and wait yeah. for it. But typically, they'll give you a shot if you'll be patient. Yeah. But in that case, he was blowing through. He wasn't going to wait on nothing. No. he. I mean, he came out and he paused and then he kind of ran forward and then he turned to the left. And I just, I mean, 
you're moving your whole setup, trying to move your whole body. We've got cameras. We've I was going to say, plus you're you, making a movie. You know, you got cameras. Or, you know, Yogi and I are cr- crammed in this little stand. And, and it just, man, it was just so disappointing. I'm glad I got a deer. We ended up getting a like a four or five-year-old nine. Um, but that big deer, man, like you just look at them on camera and you're like, Ugh. The good news is he's still there. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. I could hunt him this year. Yeah, I don't take very many people, so if yeah. you do pass one, it's normally he's still there the next year. So. Yeah, that's true. We could. This could be my year. I find him. Yep, could be. <laughs> or he could be gone, hit mm-hmm. by a car. Uh, yeah, and that's the other daylight savings. We won't go into how shitty that is, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they change daylight savings right when the deer are running and. It's ridiculous. Land based. It's the sixth of November this year. Is it? Mm-hmm. Daylight saving. Prime time. Yeah, yeah. Of course it is. Yeah. yeah. And I'll be there hunting. So, anyway, we should wrap this up because we got a stand to hang and a deer to go hunt. Yeah. It's time. It's time. All right, you guys. Thank you all for uh, joining us for this episode of the Wild and Uncut Podcast. David, uh, people, if they want to find you, your Prairie Land Outfitters on Instagram and Facebook. And if you guys are looking for great property david is also a real estate agent with white hill properties so <laughs> yeah uh, i got into that just kind of by osmosis but i really like it i mean it's well finally, you're really good at it well it's yeah. finally you're selling a product you really know yeah. and believe in it makes it a whole lot easier they you know for years i sold a lot of good products but i also had to sell some i didn't believe in and yeah. it makes it hard but selling land is it's just natural you yeah. know everything we do is surrounded by land so well and the nice thing you know if you guys are looking for stuff you know specifically like the name says, Whitetail Properties. You, I mean, you know what to look for in good property. Mm-hmm. You've been doing this. You've your success rate on just monster deer is second to none. I would say. Uh, you know, you've your room, your trophy room is just unbelievable. And uh, you know, if people want someone who can really give them good land advice, you know, you're the guy to call. So um, I encourage all of you if you are in that boat. Give give David a call and follow him on social. And if you want to book a hunt, uh, call my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. No, that's fine. <laughs> fine. Joking. As long as they come, it's good. I don't care. I'm just kidding. But uh, <coughs> yeah, no, we. Uh, I've been. I've enjoyed the last. Uh, was it five years? Six. Well, six, you said. six years. Yeah, we're filming season six this year. So yeah, six years. It's been fun. Yeah. Let's go kill one. Let's do it tonight. We'll make it the biggest. <laughs> It'd be my biggest deer if we shoot it. Yeah, would it be? It would be. That's good then. Let's do it. Yeah, let's get it done. It's not so hard. Just pull it all the way back. Just pull it all the way back (laughs) and don't F this up. Well, it's my hunt. I can do it if I want, okay? Yeah, I'm going to get you a t-shirt that says DFU. (laughs) I know what that means, David. Thank you. (laughs) We're going to end it on that. We'll see you all later. Hey everyone, chances are you'll be hunting in remote areas this hunting season with little to no cell phone service. And because of that, Onyx has a super awesome offline feature that allows you to download and save your maps within the Onyx app in advance of your hunt. Downloading the maps are super easy and it just takes a couple of minutes. So once you're in the field and you're using the Onyx Hunt app, in the offline mode, it's not only going to save your battery life, but it's also going to mean that your maps are always visible and available for your use. Onyx Hunt gives you the freedom to navigate wherever you want to go. And now you can save 20% on your new Onyx Elite membership when you use the code WILD20 during your online checkout. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.